Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with What's the Future Health? I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are checking in with one of our favorite friends. Everyone, please welcome the president and CEO of Amwell, Roy Schoenberg. Roy, it's been since February. Where have you been? <laughs> hey Jessica, where have you been? It's, it's oh, wonderful to be with you here. I can't believe how busy you must be. So I wanna jump right in and talk about what's been going on in virtual care and telehealth through this, through the end of this pandemic and kind of where we're at now. So I can always rely on you for a sweeping conversation about like the state of play of, of this part of the market. And so I, I'm going to make sure that we get that here. But let's start out and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've seen happen since you and I last spoke. So like I said, February, there have been like a number of different telehealth companies that have been acquired along the way. There have been some that have raised money. I want to hear, you know, a little bit more about the Amwell approach to being infrastructure for telehealth to enable incumbents, you know, and how this works in a world where it seems increasingly we're seeing some of those incumbents either build it themselves or buy it like, you know, Walmart and MeMD who saw that coming or, you know, use some of these free services like DoxyMe or even Zoom to provide telehealth. So in that kind of environment, how is the Amwell infrastructure positioned to win? Yeah, so we, we, we have five hours to cover that one question, right? So I think that's good. <laughs> um, you know, I would say, you know, it's interesting. I think the general kind of headline that I would use is that we're growing up. Okay. So we, we've definitely spent about, I don't know, whatever, 15 years trying to academically promote telehealth and saying to everybody, hey, it's a good thing, you know, it's not going to kill everybody, it's safe healthcare, it's good healthcare, and that, that, all that kind of stuff. Then COVID happened, and I think not because of us, it just dawned on everybody that a lot of healthcare is going to be delivered digitally. And what we're seeing now is really kind of the maturation of the market to say, okay, now that it's here, and whatever analogy you want to use, the, the, the genie is not going back in the bottle, the toothpaste is not coming back in the tube, how are we going to use this? And I think what people are finding, and that's kind of at the beginning of the answer to your question, is that telehealth is not one size fits all. It's not the same thing to everybody. And where people are saying, oh, you know, companies are buying companies and, you know, maybe video conferencing is going to be a commodity and everybody will, ever, will be able to do it. I think they are beginning to ask themselves the question, for what purpose? A lot of people have been exposed to the urgent care side of telehealth, which is probably the most atomic, you know, kind of resolution that you can get. It's a very simple transaction for as long as you are a, you know, patient and there's a clinician in good standing on the other end, you can get the two together. There's going to be some kind of simple healthcare happening. Now people are beginning to understand, hang on, there's also behavioral health. There's also primary care that can be done through telehealth. There is a notion of relationship generation. There's definitely a lot of follow-up care that happens. There's a lot of different services we never thought could happen, like medication management and, and potentially, you know, even people, you know, at home doing kind of physical therapy with, uh, with a guide on the other side of telehealth. And what that created is actually kind of a stop, stand back, let's rethink this entire thing because telehealth is a platform for redistribution of all of the care that used to happen traditionally by physical contact. And I think that is, you know, a little bit, I, I'm a big, you know, I, I really like analogies because I think they, I they know, can I love clarify that. things. <laughs> it's like, historically, people thought that, you know, online retail is a website where you can pick something and pay with credit card and you're done. Only to today understand that it is a whole different logistical view on how things get passed inside societies between people that make them, people that promote them, people that deliver them, and people that use them. And I think that is, um, that's the reality that we're seeing in the market today. Now, to, to address that, a lot of different organizations have, def have taken different approaches. As you said, some people are saying, well, this is so cool. I got to build one of my own. And hey, let's find engineers and, and put them together and make something happen. Others are saying, well, we want that, but time to market is so important because the market is so hot for telehealth. Let's buy some products that will allow us to kind of get ahead of the game 
and potentially not have to build it from scratch. And then I should say there is the, and I'm not suggesting that we're old and boring, but there are those companies that say, listen, guys, this is healthcare. You don't build a gadget and think that it's just going to work. It just does not work that way. You actually have to build it from the inside and are really kind of more clearly transitioning to become a true platform environment, a little bit like, you know, other platforms that you think about in healthcare that are, you know, indisputable, like EHRs, right? I mean, that's a foundational platform for care delivery. If you're on the pair side, it's your claim and eligibility system. That's a foundational system that you have. I think we're getting to the point that people understand that telehealth is a foundational system for healthcare. And as such, almost by definition, it's not a product, it's a platform. You need somebody trusted to build it, I suppose, right? I mean, I think we, we, we learned that lesson, start. right? Just, yeah. just, just recently, that Wall Street Journal article talking about how Apple is delaying some of their things. So it's not as easy as it seems to healthcare. You know, if you're yeah, I mean, very care. famously, some some politician, I think he was president, said, "Who who thought healthcare was so complicated? Who knew that healthcare was so complicated?" So, and and a lot of people admittedly kind of maybe sneered and said, "Ah, you know, you should have known. Everybody knows that healthcare is complicated." But here's exactly you no know, to the the point that you made the, with the Wall Street Journal article about uh, uh, about Apple recently, saying how difficult it is even for the some of the largest corporation in the world. Uh, who have ample resources and all the opportunities and everybody wants to work with them because they're so cool and all that kind of stuff, it's still very, very difficult for them to translate a lot of the things that they think about when they think about consumer service and, and everything else into healthcare because this industry ain't like any other industry we know. The, the money flow is different. The, the product definitions are different. The people that consume the care don't know what care they're getting. They have no idea. The people that deliver the care don't know how much it costs. The people that actually pay for healthcare are not in the room. Yeah. The so risk is spread around differently. Risk is spread around. Regulation is crazy and all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of different organizations that have historically been incredible in understanding what consumer wants, whether these are the Amazons of the world or the Apple of the world or the Microsoft of the world or, or others, have found it, you know, I would even say repeatedly, to be very, very difficult to penetrate healthcare with those kind of consumer understanding. Um, and they continue, right? I mean, they, they I think they, and that's, a, that's a great thing about them, that they still believe that there is so much better healthcare experience that can come with incorporating some consumer know-how into things, but it's a longer journey. It's a longer journey. All right. I have to ask, because you always, AMO, the thing that sets AMO apart to me is the fact that you guys are very much focused on being a technology company, an infrastructure yeah, company. That's right. Other telehealth companies out there focus on care. And some of them, like we saw Teladoc since last summer, have really doubled down on the care side. You know, they acquired Luvongo, yep. they've blown out their mental health. And there are others that, that follow along with that. Why go this way? And I mean, you have a provider group, so you know you're providing a little bit of care, but why, why, why bet why bet the the farm here, so to speak, on the tech side of this as opposed to on the care side of this? I think the reason for that is just a simple realization that healthcare is no, not one product. Okay, same right? I mean, the moment the, the moment that you, and, and don't get me wrong, there are products in healthcare, like we talked about, you know, urgent, urgent care, care or, you know, certain services can are really, really straightforward. If, if we believe that healthcare will be delivered over technology, which by the way, it's not we believe, I mean, how can you possibly imagine that that won't happen? Fast forward, I don't know whether it's a year or five years or whatever it is, there's not a single industry that's not going to have some chunk of the way that it operates go over technology channels or over right. technology lines. So if you know that it's inevitable that telehealth will find its way to rebalance itself between physical and digital, and we're gonna talk about automated, I'm sure at some point, but within physical and digital, then what you need to put in place is not a product that does X, but a competency to take all of those traditional products that we've learned to, I should say, love and hate, right, in, in healthcare, but all of those traditional products that over the years we've learned to trust 
and allow them to get their digital counterpart or their digital equivalents. That's a platform play. That's not a product play. You can take 10 products of healthcare and add an 11th one that is digital, or you can create a platform that allows all 10 to also use technology. I'm not going to voice my opinion, but it sounds to me like the latter one is a little bit of a better strategy. That's all. But yeah, empowering all the providers or just empowering some of them? You know, maybe. <laughs> I love that. So I understand. Catch us up, Roy, on what's been going on um, at AMO, because I understand you guys have launched um, basically like a, a new platform or you, right. you, you pull this together. It's called Converge. So what's different about this? How is this up the game on the infrastructure that AMOL is providing? So I think, you know, Converge is a huge, huge leap forward for us and hopefully to, you know, for all of our customers. For one, it's, it's really the understanding, which is a little bit like the, the question that we just talked about. It's the understanding that, you know, you can take a lot of different telehealth capabilities that we've done over the years and developed and, you know, to our mind, made them pretty good and everything else and, and continue to sell them. But if you really want to stay true to what we just talked about, we need to allow healthcare to find its digital wings, to, to begin to rethink the way that it soar and think about what it does digitally. We have to look at telehealth as an operating system. And taking a lot of different products that we had into the market and just lumping them together as a package that you can buy with one price doesn't make them an operating system. It makes them a good bundle of products. And I think that the limitation historically wasn't that big because people had only the appetite to do one thing or another thing or another thing. And sometimes only had the money to do one thing or another thing or another thing. In the world post-COVID, it's just not the case anymore. People fully understand that they need to begin to kind of think about doing everything they do over with some degree over telehealth. So the distinction between a collection of products that will work well together and an operating system platform has become very apparent. What Converge does is from the ground up, it says, let's create a foundation for digital interaction of people and logic and data and devices and all of that kind of stuff and bring into that operating system all of the best competencies that we have learned over the years in each and every one of our product lines really resonated with people. What are the things that people ended up really seeing value in, really worked well for them and everything else? Take the best of the best in each and every one of these product lines and make that a competency of that operating system such that it can work. You can take the entire thing, the entire chassis, tie it into your EHR if you're a health system, tie it into your payment system or your, your, your claim system if you're a payer or your digital front door, and you essentially have the ability to rewrite your future with anything that telehealth offers. This doesn't do it justice. But I think that the, the transition from a lot of different products to really a digital interaction operating system for healthcare is the calling card of Converge. Okay, so let's give this give you a chance here to do it some justice because one of the things I'm okay. thinking as you're talking is you're talking about you know th this bundle approach of old and how it was kind of things are pieced together versus actually building an operating system that things layer upon. Give us a sense, like for those who may not really be familiar with the virtual care market from the buying level, like those health yeah. plan customers that you guys have, like United and Anthem, or even like the big health systems where you guys have, I mean, hundreds of health systems that you work with. How, how, not, I don't want to say like, how off was this before, as opposed to where it's come to now? Like, can you give us a sense of like what the state of play, how, like what the, the key things that have changed, the hallmarks? of sure. where we're at now versus where we were before in terms of like how pieced together this actually kind of was before this pandemic hit. Yeah, I mean, I will, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not doing justice. There are a lot of, not a lot, but there are, there are a couple of institutions, both on the health system side and on the pair side 
that got all of that even before COVID. So I, I don't want to make it too much of a generalization. Yeah, but yeah. for the most part, prior to COVID, most of telehealth was two animals, urgent care and telestroke. Okay. That was the vast majority of volume of telehealth that you've seen. Today, there are hundreds of applications of telehealth. And the way that they're done is no longer you know, by the recipe of the manual of the product that we create, but rather by the innovation of the people that run those organizations. To give you an example, um, we had a product, we still do have a product that, that offers, you know, white label urgent care capabilities. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, a lot of, you know, even health systems, hospitals, um, wanted to incorporate that as a service that their communities could take advantage of. And to staff those services, we had our we have our AMG clinician network that runs 50 states 24 seven and everything else. And that was a great product still is a great product. Today, the health systems are saying, hang on, you know, we have clinicians, we have nurse practitioners, we have physician assistants, we have pharmacists, we have all of these different skills. We also want to participate in that offering to the community using a varying, you know, to varying degrees, our own clinicians. But our own clinicians are on Epic or on Cerner. That's the reality. So how do you actually take telehealth that lives inside an EHR or clinicians that live inside an EHR and allow them to participate in services that are offered to a broader audience, to a broader community, region, you know, geography. The moment that you start crossing those lines, any one of these products on their own break. Okay. They can't do it. They don't speak the language. So that's an example from a health system standpoint where their, their clinicians are beginning to be much more involved in the delivery of every variant of, of telehealth. If you want to take a pair example, a good example is that pairs historically were sponsoring services. That was their job. They were yeah. paying the bill, right? Paying the claim. That's what they, they do for a living. And they paid, some paid more and some paid less and all that kind of fun conversation we can have. But that was the role in the world. Now, payers are saying, well, hang on. The vast majority of consumption of healthcare is actually starting at the primary care level. Your PCP, when you're an American person, you know, you have some issue, you go to your PCP, and they say, oh, we're going to send you there. We're going to prescribe that to you. You may need that kind of procedure and everything else. So the PCP relationship is a huge starting point. It's kind of a gating point to the consumption of healthcare. A lot of the payers are now saying, hang on, maybe in a world where people are comfortable interaction, interacting with clinicians digitally, maybe we should offer a digital version of primary care for people who are tech savvy, who feel comfortable doing it and everything else. And we can be much more involved, not only on making healthcare more accessible, which is something we write our name on, but also involved in helping the navigation of those patients and their journey of consumption of healthcare services on our own, under our own brand, rather than just pay the claim. And you know, it is what it is. You gotta pay right. the claim when it comes in. Now, that is completely breaking the rules, right? Because now the pairs are delivering care and they are to some degree participating in the logic and the thinking about what care should be rendered or what care is right for that patient or not. That's, that wasn't their business before. So now they're breaking the rules. So when you start looking, so these are, this is an example about a health system and a pair. Which no, and I love this. Like it's this gives you a sense of how a collection of products that each one is good at one thing won't work anymore because people have to people and services and the rules of engagement have to traverse all of the entire ecosystem of care delivery or, or care consumption. And you need an operating system for that. Imagine, I'll just say one thing, Jessica, again, in the, in the, changing. In, in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of analogies, 
I love when you get in the spirit of analogies, Roy. Can I just, well, it, that, that's my favorite <laughs> spirit. That you could analogy. Be in. <laughs> I just thought about it this, uh, uh, right this <laughs> Think about, you know, Word and Outlook and Excel and PowerPoint, okay? Collection of products, each one doing amazing work on, I'm not, I'm not, you know, plugging here for Microsoft or whatever it is. But each one does a very, very good job at what they I mean, do. it might not be a bad idea. They acquired nuance this year, you know? Yeah, they, they a lot of good things. Now imagine that you really look at them as an isolated product. And the example that I want to give here is imagine copy and paste didn't exist. There's no way. The products are very good at what they do. There's no way for you to begin to move things around. There's no flexibility for you to create some narrative in Word and paste it into a PowerPoint and you know, drop in an Excel spreadsheet or a chart or whatever it is. The world suddenly becomes very, very difficult to maneuver. Mm -hmm. It becomes, it limits your ability to innovate. It limits your ability to create things you know, very quickly and use the power of every one of these different individual tooling. That is where it comes back to platform services that are under the different products that give all of these wings. That is why a platform and operating system is so critical. That's a great analogy, Roy. I like that one. For that to just hit you right now, that's pretty good. Just <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're, you're good at virtual care infrastructure and also analogies. I, I love it. I love it. All right. So let's talk about this for a second, because I think I feel like you thank you very much for just for breaking that down so that those who may not be so up to their eyeballs and virtual care and telehealth can understand what's really going on and how this is working actually in the in the market. And I love what you said about the rules of engagement having been changed, you yeah. know, um, over the course, in particular, of the last couple of years. So tell me what else has changed. The last time we spoke, you said to me, this was again at the beginning of this year, 21, you're like, regulation is going to be the topic we're all talking about. This is going to be it. And then, and I'm curious to know, you know, do you still feel that way about regulation? Like, what do you got your eye on? Like, what's next here? As, as we get back to normal, as, you know, it, the, the inertia of maybe providing healthcare the old way we used to do it maybe creeps back in. What do you think is ahead as far as telehealth is concerned? Well, I think that the, you know, what we, what we talked about in February continues to be the right thing to look at it. I think that the regulatory discussion around payment and the legitimacy of the home as a, as a care setting, which shockingly took us to 2021 to, to understand that that's where people actually want to get the care. Um, so I think, I think all of these are, are, are still obviously in play, but there's no question that as the power of telehealth increases, as people's understanding on its liberating, you know, nature of allowing healthcare to flow pretty liberally from where it is available to where it's needed, it still continues to be state licensure stands in the way. State licensure makes very little sense as it is mm -hmm. um, in, in a world where knowledge and care can flow, you know, relatively easily, just like any other thing happens over the internet. State licensure today is a limitation. Now, that doesn't mean in any sense that it doesn't serve purposes, that it has certain things that it is supposed to do, things that have to do with quality control, things that have to do with, you know, some of the process by which, you know, physicians and, 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 and patients interact and medical boards in, in that sense. But those upsides, I believe, can be we can find ways to maintain them without forcing quarantining of healthcare into 50 bordered states yeah. um has enough, been done? That one. has enough has enough happened do you think have, have enough of the people who had who have vested interest in keeping that quarantine yeah. <clears throat> have enough of them you know seen the light you think for this to to maybe at least open up the conversation in a different way? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical in my old age. I oh, think that uh, <laughs> you know, just a little bit here and there. I think that a lot of people, it, you know, it, it obviously dawned on everybody that not allowing a perfectly good clinician to be made available to a patient who needs them 
makes no sense whatsoever. You, you cannot claim that the patient well-being is better served by not allowing them to see an available clinician somewhere around the country, that they're better off on their own going to WebMD and treating themselves or you know, reading a book and treating themselves. But that, the, the cynical part is that I think that while the motivation is there, you still have to find a financial incentive to act. It's the world we live in. But I think what's going to happen is that that financial incentive is going to become clearer and clearer, literally on a monthly basis right now, because we fully, you know, just like the, the example that we talked about about virtual primary care, the ability to make sure that patients get in front of the right clinicians in the right timing is only possible if you rethink the notion of availability of services using technology. Mm -hmm. Because people live, you know, if you live in Boston, the trees are clinicians. I mean, everybody here is a clinician. If you live in other parts of the country, you may need to travel a long, long, long time before you get the clinician, not to mention to get the specialist or the, the behavioral health provider that you need to see and so on. I think people are coming to terms when they start looking at outcomes and cost analysis and claims and all of that kind of stuff, that the delay of care or the care that's being rendered by a clinician who is of lower training than the issue that the patient is exhibiting, because that's what you have in that geography, the price we pay for that is so enormous that you're going to have to start thinking about redistribution of healthcare over technology in order to rectify that that number and i think the dollars are beginning to do the cha-ching for everybody and i think that's why it's going to actually happen let's hope so i mean that's yeah. and i love how you put that i mean the last time i spoke with you i went back and one of the things i love the most about that interview is how you're talking about telehealth has long been put into the box of oh it's improving access but it's not an access issue anymore this is a quality issue and quality right. definitely has an impact on the bottom line because if you're getting higher quality healthcare, it helps reduce costs, right? So, so I mean, I think it's that. And then uh, the other thing I love too is, is this reframing of the relationship with the physician into, into a relationship that is digital and what is possible when that happens. And I think, I mean, you guys are positioned with your, your operating system approach here to do just that, right? That's it. I mean, we, we, what we are trying to build is, is a canvas, right? It's, it's the opportunity for people who are much more creative than, than us in Amwell or, or, or in another vendor company or whatever it is, to utilize these technologies to reinvent the way that they do healthcare. I love that. And, and that, that has, first of all, that's a very humbling experience because as I said, we're old, you know, we thought for, you know, for 15 years, we're the oracles of telehealth and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Years. <laughs> For, for a long period of time, nobody want, nobody even knew what telehealth was. So, right. so we, we were kind of steered into the position of we're telling everybody about telehealth and, and what it is. It's really the understanding that that is, it's, it's just a different world. And we're all going to be in such a better position if telehealth becomes a tool in the hands of the people that are on the street, at the scene of the crime, that actually do, do care to innovate with it rather than for us to innovate it on our whiteboards. We want to give people the ability to, in the field, paint a better future of people's healthcare experience. And that's the canvas that, again, coming back, that's a platform, that's an operating system, not an end product. All right, last thing for you, real quick. What's what's coming down the pike at Amwell? What's coming up next? I mean, I feel like there's lots of eyes on, on you guys and like the other two publicly traded telehealth type yeah. companies. So, so, I mean, yeah, so, t so tell us what's ahead. <laughs> I think the, you know, I, I, I've been beaten enough since we went public. I've been beaten enough to know that there are things that you, you can't talk about things that some of your investor community is not aware of. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to be very, very careful on the way that you, you navigate this. But I think what's ahead for us is the beginning of, um, of seeing how those dots are connecting, right? So one of the very, very different things, unique things about Amwell is that we are equally invested in the pair market as we are on the delivery side. 
So we, we, we are in both places. And as we talked about already, even in this conversation, every one of these sides is now beginning to move a little bit on the other side and are beginning, yeah. you know, health systems are taking risk, payers are beginning to be involved in care. You have, you have amazing organizations like the Optums of the world that are really in the middle of everything, doing everything and so on. So the, we're at the point where the market is moving towards that notion of a platform. We are moving into the market with a platform and we're beginning to see the sparks. We're beginning to see how these two things generate really amazing, amazing reimagining and reformatting of the way that healthcare is being delivered at the level of something that a patient can actually experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of making prophecies, but I think that we are beginning to see the fog of war, you know, receding. And my bet is that what will surface, you know, when that goes away is really the opportunity for us to, to, to imagine a completely different healthcare experience in, in within our immediate time frame. I love it. I hope those sparks ignite, burn the whole thing to the ground. No, I'm joking. I think that, that's what's going to happen. From the ashes shall arise a new, that's digitally it. empowered healthcare system. Oh gosh. Yeah, I love I it. Think I think that's where we're going to be. And I think and it's- you said uh, you were sometimes a cynic and not an optimist. I love it, Roy. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, you could be cynical about certain things and be an optimist about other things. I think you can- This mix is a philosophical things. debate that I'm never going to win. And so I know when to call it quits. So on this note, I'm going to just say, Roy, thank you so much for stopping by. It was so good to catch up with you. You always- you always have some of these things that just then get my mind reeling. And it's like in the middle of the night, I wake up and I'm like, I think we're going to do it. Like, <laughs> Jessica, anytime, seriously, anytime. I'm, I'm going to take some of the things that we talked about that I didn't think about and write them down because maybe there's more things. Oh my to God, do that with Microsoft it. analogy. So, yeah. Very good, my friend. Very, very good. <laughs> we'll send you a transcript of this interview. Roy Schoenberg, the Perfect. CEO of Amwell. Thank you so much for stopping by. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. It's a pleasure. Good seeing everybody and uh, to be continued. Yes, definitely. All right, everybody, to find more interviews with some of the people who are changing the way that we are doing healthcare in a very big way, um, please check out my YouTube channel over there at youtube.com slash WTF Health. And while you're there, I would watch that other interview with Roy. That was a pretty good one, too. <laughs> we'll see you later. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.